Um, Dr. Cigar is with uh, UTMB, and he is a, uh, better grab my notes here so I get the uh, thing. He's assistant professor in family medicine, uh, and uh, with a, a specialization in integrative and behavioral medicine fellow. Uh, and, uh, and as we've got, our talk will be pillars and practices for a healthier life and introduction to integrative herbal medicine. So I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to the guy that knows what he's doing. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Kim Pratt, thank you so much. Uh, oh, and I'll anytime. Over to you. Well, happy to be here and nice to meet you all. And I hope today's talk will be fun. And a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Kempreth. I've trained in University of Pittsburgh for the last essentially 12 years, undergrad, med school, residency. And I came over here to UTMB for a fellowship. And during my time in Pittsburgh, in my undergraduate years, I learned some Japanese and ended up going over there to work a few times and was interested in Japanese herbal medicine and the idea of herbal medicine in general and came to UTMB for the fellowship in integrated behavioral medicine to basically broaden my practice perspective so I can become more of a healer in my eyes and the kind of doctor I envision to be. So over here in Galveston, I have been having the opportunity to learn um, so many different modalities of medicine, including Kampo, Ayurveda, and just general nutrition principles, which uh, were not always taught to us in med school and beyond. So the impetus was us on, on us to learn nutrition essentially. And that's why I want to impart on you all today, the focus of nutrition for health and then the integrative approach to herbal medicine as the last part of the lecture. So it is a very broad topic. And just going forward, I wanted to frame it as the human body is very interesting that it has the ability to self-repair. So it's a very complex machine that we don't give it as much credit as it deserves, I think. So the ability for our bodies to, um, is there a question? Oh, sorry. Uh, if there's a question, feel free to interrupt anytime. So I'm going to yeah, how long I'm gonna take? I'm right here, uh, moderating the chat. So if you have a question, I'll let you know. Okay, cool. All right. So learning objectives for today's lecture, I wanted to start off with understanding why we get chronic diseases and the aging process, then understand the role of the food industry in our health. And from there, a story about a colleague of mine who used to work in our clinic and how he had influenced my practice perspectives for the future and currently, and then appreciate the anti-inflammatory diet and the concept of food as medicine in my small introduction to herbal medicine at the end of the lecture. I think we have more people coming in. All right. So the question that um, I was asked before is the aging question. So is aging simply a consequence of just decline in time or is it a physiological process or program that we can modulate or possibly even reverse? And that's an interesting thought to have as we work in medicine or in any profession, you can see people um, change from beginning to later on in life. And I'm bringing up two examples uh, just as a point of interest. This is Kanae Tanaka. She will be turning 119 next month, I think on January 2nd, uh, one of the world's oldest people. She has survived World War II and is no stranger to sadness or life. Um, she lost both her husband and son in World War II. But when asked when her happiest moment was during an interview with Google, she said, it was right now. And her favorite things in life are friends, family, and naps. So a very interesting person. And along those lines, this is a French cyclist who between the ages of 101 and 103 increased his um, ability to use oxygen while exercising. And that was remarkable to show after the pa past the age of 100, the human body's capable of improving even past the age of 100. And he owes a lot of his health to following the Mediterranean diet, which I will discuss later on in the lecture today. So aging itself is sort of a risk factor for a lot of the diseases and ailments we see um, as we go through life. And that's likely due to the idea of oxidative stress or free radical damage to, towards cells. And it's a concept that I've learned um, that was called inflammation by another doctor that I liked. And it's the idea that as we age and accumulate um, more experience in life, the cells do go through their metabolic processes, accumulate 
um, the wear and tear of most machines and eventually break down and suffer, um, suffer the test of time. So with any disease that I see in medicine, whether it be neuro, um, in the neurosciences, in cardiology, in the GI tract, it's all due to inflammation in a sense. So the idea behind um, good medicine, I think, is trying to mitigate or limit inflammation or even prevent inflammation so the body can be at an optimal state. And that goes for both the mind and the body, I think. So it's a very interesting perspective to have uh, as a healthcare practitioner or any of the fields um, where we're trying to provide help for people. So this is just to reiterate the point of um, the generation of free radical species, which uh, damage the cells over the time, um, which is associated with aging. And along those lines, it's kind of a lot of jargon I might have just thrown at you, but if I focus on one thing called the C word or cancer, it can put inflammation and aging in a more understandable sense. And cancer is a term that I come across a lot in my profession, but I think you all have heard a lot, especially as we become more and more modernized. If you notice the trends of cancer in the modern world, the countries highlighted in red and orange are the ones with the highest rates. And what we have in common was they're all very developed nations. I'd say the more advanced nation is, the higher the rates of cancer or certain disease processes that are kind of privy to those who have, I think, more access to certain kinds of foods and lifestyles. And that's mostly, I think, the culprit behind a lot of disease processes we see in this country. And what's different from before versus today is, I think, diet, the amount of chemicals we're exposed to, the sedentariness of our jobs, and our social structure, we move from more of a extended family model to more of a nuclear family model. And the social isolation that I think has been underlined during specific COVID times is, um, is very important to understand. So the, as a healthcare, healthcare provider, practitioner, doctor, uh, I think we all have the best interests of patients in mind, but sometimes I think it takes a discerning eye to, to help people and for us to always question what's out there and always strive for improvements. And even with cancer care, um, I, I've seen recommendations of um, having people eat high calorie foods, which is good when you're having um, lower weight or you want to gain weight, but recommendations such as adding sugar and jam to foods, ice cream to foods was recommended by the American Cancer Society um, for a certain subset of patients. But if you look at cancer cells, what they thrive off of is actually sugar. And if we want to limit the spread of disease process, we want to limit things that cause inflammation. And the two things that cause inflammation in the body are sugar and alcohol, which will be the focus of the things I want you to avoid in the future. So if I ask you all what these three food companies have in common. If anyone wants to shout out an answer, you can, but I can tell you in a few seconds. Packaging. Yeah. The packaging is beautiful. Do you want to say more about that? Um, it, it just grabs your attention when you see bright colors, bold words, uh, things like that. It's usually the first thing you'll grab on the shelves. Totally. Yeah. These are clearly marketed towards kids, placed at eye level, um, beautiful colors, meant to attract their attention. And um, the people behind this are actually very smart at marketing, and this is something they really focus on. And if you look at the three companies that are making these um, packages, it's Kraft, Nabisco, and General Foods. And what they all have in common is they're all subsidiaries of uh, Big Tobacco. The company is actually R.J. Reynolds. And when tobacco fell under scrutiny um, or in their 1990s, they invested in something a bit more family friendly, which was the food industry. So we have some really smart people running the food industry and they do try to optimize and market these foods to the point that we can't say no to them. So there's something called the bliss point when they make foods as addictive as possible. It's the optimal ratio of sugar, fat, and salt that stimulates the reward center in the brain for hyperpalatability, so our dopamine responses go higher with these foods, so we can't really put them down. And um, this is the goal, um, like when you do have like a bag of Cheetos or Doritos, you basically wanna finish the bag before you put it down. And that's what the end goal is for the companies, the bottom dollar rather than your health. 
So uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but sugar is um, possibly more addictive than cocaine in some studies. It acts on the same parts of the brain. And both sugar and cocaine in their natural states probably aren't that dangerous. Um, cocaine, they used to put the leaves under their tongue and have a little bit more energy throughout the day when people um, ran errands and used the plant for medicinal purposes. And same thing with sugar. The average American consumes about 82 grams of sugar a day. And if you wanna consume that much sugar naturally through sugarcane, which is where sugar comes from, you'd have to have about two pounds of sugarcane. And if you can eat two pounds of sugarcane, great. And that comes with all that fiber. So you'd slow down the absorption of the sugar from the sugar cane and no one can really eat two pounds of sugar anyway. So 82 grams of sugar is rather unfeasible in a normal natural setting. But when you refine it, it becomes very accessible in the foods that we eat today. So two cans of Coke, you already exceeded about 80 grams of sugar. So, and when I say sugar, there's um, sugar in a lot of foods you may not think of, not just, not just candy bars, but it's an additive to a lot of creams and um, extra sauces. And there's over 80 different names for sugar too. So it is a game where you're reading labels to figure out what exactly has sugar and what doesn't. Um, my general rule of thumb is if it doesn't have a label, you can probably trust it. Meaning if it's a fruit, vegetable or something on the edge of the grocery store, it's probably a bit safer to eat. So I'm talking about sugar in relation to cancer because almost half of cancers I think are diet modifiable and possibly preventable. So when we say cancer, I wanna talk about a story of a colleague from my old clinic at the University of Pittsburgh, Shadyside Family Medicine Residency. The colleague was Dr. David Servenschreiber. He was a French psychiatrist who um, was doing research in neuroscience. One day his patient didn't show up and he popped an MRI scanner himself just to see um, his own brain. And his friend had incidentally found a cancerous growth in his brain, a GBM. And his prognosis to live was only about a year. And his team told him, um, let us worry about the cancer. You just go back to your lifestyle and enjoy the last year of your life. And David, being a doctor, did um, research. Yes? Oh. Anyone? Uh, he researched the cancer um, literature at the time and came up with four anti-cancer pillars, which is essentially diet, exercise, avoiding toxins, and stress management. And with these things, he survived almost 20 more years. And his message and my message is a lot of these things are common sense things that we can promote for ourselves, our patients, and our loved ones. And it can make a huge impact on not just cancer, but any inflammatory process. So mostly, almost any disease process can benefit from these interventions. So when you ask if there's a link between nutrition and cancer previously, not much of a thought here, but now, nowadays there's clearly a link established between the two and any disease process. And combining nutrition with exercise can actually help ameliorate the oxidative stress, um, decrease insulin resistance, and then promote um, promote healing of the body, coupled with a plant-rich diet. So I hope you guys are enjoying the memes to help make the lecture more fun too. So combined with mindfulness and avoiding um, all the toxins that we are exposed to every day, I don't think we pay much attention to the chemicals that are in the cleaners, in the things we ingest, not just cigarettes and alcohol, but in the sodas and the packaging, even in the way some clothes are made, we should be a little bit more careful of what we're exposed to. Um, it's interesting when we look at all the things that we have around us, and if you compare cancer demographics based on countries and populations, there are certain places where people don't have access to certain technologies and uh, products who have lack of certain kinds of cancers. So it's interesting to see the connections that we have between modern convenience and modern disease. And you might ask why now it might be due to better surveillance, better monitoring or better diagnoses, but there's also a shift from being more hunter gatherer to more of a sedentary society with 24 seven food choices available to us. We can eat anything we want any time of the day from any part of the world. So it's a great um, success, but it's also a double-edged sword that we should also be aware of. So if you wanted to leave the lecture now and take away one message, this is a message from Dr. Michael Pollan. It summarizes what you can do for better health. 
it's essentially eat more food, not too much, mostly plants. So food, not too much, mostly plants. And um, you can have a long and healthy life this way. And what Dr. Pollan is getting at is following more of an anti-inflammatory diet. The one of the best ones that we recommend patients is the Mediterranean style diet, which is basically fruits, um, fruits, vegetables, cold water, fish, some poultry and lean meats too. Um, if you are to eat meats, meats high in omega-3s are good for you. So grass-fed, pasture-raised, those um, higher quality meats are a bit more higher in omega-3s compared to omega-6s, which cause inflammation in the body. And the Mediterranean diet is actually associated with less cardiac death. They did a study on it, the PREDIMED heart trials, where they put patients on the Mediterranean diet and then on the standard American diet, ended up stopping the study early because the people doing the Mediterranean diet were actually living a much longer time than people on the standard, um, standard diet. So uh, this is just a book picture I wanted to show you um, by Dr. Pratt. Uh, basically shows pictures of superfoods. Um, he lists about um, almost 20 here. And the idea behind them is they're all very colorful and interesting looking. So when I say diet, I don't mean it to be restrictive by the sense of the word. It actually opens up the doors for trying different foods, different fruits, different vegetables that you may not have been aware of. So if you see it, it's mostly the colors of the rainbow. So for each color, you can pick a food and try something different and really vary your palate and ability to try different foods, cook, and see different cultures too. Because um, you can learn a lot about food and health um, by the way we eat. So when I mentioned omega-3s before, um, we have wild salmon, spinach, walnuts, blueberries, all these things are very good. And this is all part of the anti-inflammatory diet. They're all really, they're really not mutually exclusive. And I always recommend fish oil to our patients too as an additional supplement just because it does benefit the heart health, helps triglycerides and has a whole host of other benefits for other conditions such as anxiety, concentration, and also triglyceride levels too. So if there's specific questions about anything, um, I'm happy to answer it as well. And this is a slide by Dr. Andy Weil. It is the anti-inflammatory diet pyramid, which is very similar to the Mediterranean diet pyramid, but essentially the commonalities between all these different pyramids or food groups is they're all natural foods closer to their whole constituent ingredient. So the less ingredients for a food, the better. So if you're preparing the food, you're shopping on the edge of the grocery store and you're cooking in essentially extra virgin olive oil, it is a much healthier way to engage with your food and consume food. Oh, so um, greens, legumes um, are also a good part of the diet as well. When you cook your pasta, you wanna to try to cook it al dente or firm to the bite. If you overcook your pasta, um, it can get broken down to the sugary um, constituents more easily. So I like to cook it a little bit more firm and try to have more complex grains, higher fiber breads. Um, like um, on the island, two recommendations I give is Dave's Killer Bread and Ezekiel Bread, or no bread at all if you can, because um, less carbohydrates and more of a state of ketosis or the keto diet is actually beneficial to brain health for our older patients. And uh, if there's any more questions about that, we do a certain protocol in our clinic called the Bredesen Protocol to help people with possibilities or susceptibilities to Alzheimer's um, with dietary modification. So I have a really scary slide here. If you look at this, this is essentially the inflammatory pathway that I think I had to memorize at some point in medical school. Um, and you can intervene with all um, this pathway to stop the inflammation with common medications like steroids, aspirin, NSAIDs, um, Celebrex, um, and other medications to help with allergies in the right corner here. But what's interesting is the same pathway you can also mitigate with foods such as onions and apples, which are high in quercetin, uh, turmeric, which has the curcumin, and then other um, fruits and vegetables, which can have intermediaries in this pathway to stop the inflammation. So basically the food here is acting as medicine. And if you have an anti-inflammatory diet, you don't really need to take the pain medicine every day. So quite interesting. And coupled with exercise, a healthy lifestyle of avoiding smoking and alcohol and um, good breath work and relaxation and social support, people can have very healthy lives. So 
A healthy breathing technique we teach our patients to couple nutrition, exercise, and mindfulness is 478 breathing, which was pioneered by Dr. Andy Weil, who is the face of integrated medicine. It essentially stimulates the vagal nerve. And all you have to do is, if you want to try it or try it tonight, is breathe in through your nose for a count of four, hold your breath for a count of seven, and exhale through your mouth, making a whoosh sound for the count of eight. For four or five cycles, this can help you relax and give you a sense of calm. Try to do it in the morning and the evening. And the more and more you do it, the more it increases your heart rate variability or the beat to beat variability between your heartbeats, which is actually a marker of good cardiac health. So any sort of breath work, meditation, or just taking some time to unplug can be extremely beneficial for the mind. The same, the analogy that I give for it is actually like, you know, turning your cell phone off for a couple hours. If you leave your cell phone on all day, it overheats, is a bit more sluggish, too many apps open at once. If you restart it and let it shut down for a few hours, it's cooler and then it also operates a bit more faster. I think our brain and our GI systems are the same way. Meditation and small fasts for our GI system can give it a break to basically clean out all the debris and give it a chance to reset. So um, not part of today's lecture, but fasting and meditation can be very helpful um, for the immune system, inflammation, um, sleep, and also pain. So when we think about food, I just want you guys to think about colorful, um, interesting, varied foods. So there's no diet that I'm telling you guys to particularly follow. I just want you to have an open-minded sense of trying new colorful things and having the idea of food as medicine. And when we move to the concept of um, herbal medicine, there's a whole host of um, different herbs, different plants, things you may or may not have heard of. Interestingly enough, a lot of the things that we have in herbal medicine, you probably have sitting in your kitchen counter or in your cabinets or your pantries. And you might be using a lot of these things as spices too. So if you look at things like adaptogens, like ginseng, ashwagandha, rhodiola, these things are helpful in terms of helping people with cognition, relaxation, um, you might see them in common, commonly marketed things such as nootropics today, which are very big. But things like ginseng can be good for energy and concentration. Ashwagandha is a natural Ayurvedic herb for relaxation, also for mental health and libido too. And rhodiola can be a nice energizing concentration um, supplement as well. So all these things have been used by different cultures for very long periods of time. There's anti-inflammatory botanicals too. I listed a few previously in the slide where I showed you all the scary medicines and the ways to intervene with them. And basically, I don't want to overwhelm you with each and every herbal medicine, but I picked and chose a few herbs to talk about that are of interest. And if you have any specific questions about ones I didn't talk about, I'm happy to touch base on those as well. But the one I like most is uh, turmeric, which you probably have heard of. I think they sell it in Kroger's um, next to the ginger. It actually looks just like ginger. The only possible side effect is it can stain your fingertips and your countertops yellow because it has that very strong color. The active portion of turmeric is curcumin, which is very poorly absorbed by our body. So by itself, turmeric doesn't have much of an effect. But in Indian cooking, we usually couple it with black pepper. And the piprine in the black pepper helps absorb the curcumin into the body. So the bioavailability of the turmeric is much enhanced by the black pepper. So in any sort of dish, there's always black pepper with turmeric. If you choose to buy the supplement, they always combine it with piperine in the capsule itself. Um, and the average Indian consumes about four grams of turmeric a day just because of all the stuff it's added to. Interestingly, Kraft in Europe colors their macaroni with turmeric. I think here they still use yellow food dye. And uh, when you are buying supplements online and other things, I would always encourage you to do your research and check the brands because there's always been stories of heavy metal contamination or not proper marketing of these things. So I always try to go for the most natural formulation of these things. And the herb is sold right next to the ginger at Kroger's. So if you ever want to try turmeric, uh, you can cut some up and cook it just like ginger with your food. And it's more of a bitter astringent taste, so it's um, better for savory dishes. And then next to turmeric is ginger. They look very similar. Um, ginger has a whole host of uses. Um, I actually recommend it for migraines. Thumb sized piece of ginger in hot water, sit through the day, is very effective for migraines and good for nausea too. 
and is a good, um, a good addition to the dishes for flavors as well. And then um, switch shifting gears to berberine. This is a nice um, supplement for antimicrobial activity against viruses, protozoans, um, and other disease processes. And it can act as an anti-inflammatory for the gut and licorice increases the absorption of berberine. And along this line, garlic in your cookie can actually act as a natural antimicrobial as well. Um, to the point that I think it was used uh, possibly in World War I by the Russians when they couldn't use penicillin or afford penicillin, they used garlic for their wounds. So interesting anecdote there. And uh, this is another Ayurvedic herb that I've grown to like. It's called Bacopa monieri, and it is a, a nootropic to help with brain cognition, mental health, and concentration, and can also help increase BDNF or brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, which is like miracle growth for the brain. It helps um, basically form the connections between the cells and retain memory. Another thing that increases BDNF is actually exercise. So I encourage you all to exercise in between your studies because that is um, definitely one of the best things we can do for ourselves. But BDF has also been shown to affect uh, GBM cells in brain cancer as well. So um, there's a whole host of uses for these naturally occurring compounds in nature. When we make pharmaceuticals, we take something and we distill it and make it a bit more concentrated and effective, but we're trying not to lose sight of what we're deriving them from and keeping an open mind to all these things that have been available for thousands of years. So when I say herbal medicine, it's basically old traditional medicine that we are just restudying and repurposing the information that's already out there. So I try to remain humble and learn from all the different cultures that can offer us these insights for the future. So um, I ended on one compound here that I think you might all be aware of. You probably heard of St. John's wort, right? Most likely you have seen it for depression or marketed over the counter. It's actually shown to be helpful for mood depression. Um, just as effective um, compared to placebo. Uh, the only caveat I have is with any, any sort of medication or herbal supplement is to always talk with your doctor because St. John's Ward actually has multiple medical um, medicine interactions with commonly prescribed medicines. So anytime you choose to take an herbal supplement or medicine, always talk to your provider just to let them know or keep them in the loop. Um, given how medicines can interact since we're all prescribed different things these days. So I just wanted to make you aware of that possibility. So, and if you ever had a drink or- I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah. to but, uh, somebody's asking a question where it is a good place to go to buy these herbal supplements at, what if you recommend a place? Yeah. Um, so in Galveston, there is a place called Peak Nutrition right next to Randall's. Um, that's a place where they're aware of a lot of different supplements and they help our patients pick and choose different, um, different uh, medicines and supplements. Um, and then when I do see our patients, we do, our, we do research on what brands are generally decent and what are good. So we give them a list of some good choices. But for formulations and good herbal supplements, Herbs is a good, good place to go. Um, they do their due diligence and their research. So when I was studying for my boards, that that is a sustainably sourced place for um, for herbal medication. I can write that down for people and find the link. So yeah, also a question about location. There's also a, uh, a nutrition center, GNC Nutrition, next to uh, Target. Um, are you aware of any of their products? I am not, but I'm sure they probably have some decent ones there too. Yeah, they're a national chain. Yes. Um, and the only caveat I have is um, whenever there's a good herb or supplement, I try to see if there's a way for us to incorporate it into our cooking and our lifestyle. And if I can't, I might get it as a supplement, but I always be wary with how many supplements I would be considering taking because after a certain point, our body can only absorb so much. So I would not necessarily go overboard on the supplement train, but really focus on the dietary modification of how to incorporate these ideas of food into our lifestyle and as medicine. 
because when a diet is wrong, medicine is of no use, but when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. So that is what I would like to leave you guys with. And when you have a good diet and you're stimulating good health, um, in Ayurveda, we say that it stimulates your digestive fire or your Agni, and that helps promote good, good metabolic processing in the body. Like everything is moving in an optimal way. But if you're not moving well or feeling well or eating well, um, it affects every other part of the body. So it's not just the diet. It's not just the exercise. It's a combination of everything. So oftentimes we compartmentalize and we just treat you for one issue at a time at the, at the hospital or at the clinic. But in reality, it's a multifaceted process. So even if your provider doesn't have the time to address every issue, over time, we should be trying to think about the connections between the mind, the body, and the gut, and everything else, and not treating everything else as one thing separate from each other, because in reality, everything's interconnected. So I wanted to leave you all with that um, little piece of information. But time is, time is always our biggest factor, but we can do well by acknowledging that, um, especially for ourselves and our loved ones. And for anyone who is medical here, that's useful to think of for your patients when you're taking care of them as well. So I hope that was useful. And I think I left enough time for some questions. Um, I just wanted to say first, I thought all of this information was super, super useful. Um, I agree with the packaging of like high sugar products. I mean, I, I'll say that I, I myself have bought things because I know that they'll be quick and it's easy. Um, but you know, I have some gut health issues myself. So I've been trying, uh, you know, to buy more fresh produce and it's, it's really easier than people think it is. It's not as, um, like of a financial burden as people think it is. It, it, it really is doable. And I have a family of four, so I, I mean, I'm making it work, but one question I do have for you, um, so I, I have a problem with caffeine. That is one thing that I can't seem to kick. And I've tried replacing with herbal teas. Um, you know, I've tried increasing my water intake. Um, of course, more fresh air exercise, of course. Do you have any recommendations on, on keeping energy throughout the day? Uh, yeah, I mean, I myself use caffeine, but what kind of caffeine were you using? Uh, mostly you know, espresso, coffee drinks. Uh, I did do energy drinks for a while, but I've kicked that finally. <laughs> okay. How many coffees a day, may I ask? Oh, I would usually just drink one, but I would get like a double shot espresso drink. Um, so two shots of espresso. Uh, and then I would try to drink water throughout the day, but of course the soda would come in there somewhere. Um, sodas is one thing I'm working on, but I've got myself down to maybe two or three a week instead of doing one a day like I was before. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that can be a tough habit to kick, especially in med school residency, I would pretty much just drink coffee. But black coffee um, and tea is not a bad, um, a bad thing to consume. It's actually not terrible for the all body. Of, all about quantity, of course, yeah. But, yeah, the quantity is important there too. But, uh, <laughs> but if the black coffee or uh, tea is too much, like a nice, um, safer source of caffeine. Um, I like to give um, myself and our patients is green tea. Uh, there's natural antioxidants and actually stimulates thermogenesis. So it's also good for weight loss too. And it's essentially on tap in Japan. So most of the country drinks that in addition to water. So green tea by itself without any added, added sugar or anything else, I think is a good drink to do. You can sweeten it with a little bit of honey, but I wouldn't go overboard with any extra sweeteners if possible. Um, and if you do a sugar fast for at least three days, um, you'll notice your taste buds sort of reset and don't crave the sugar as much. But when you have high carb, high sugary foods, there's an associated crash with that that makes you more tired. But if you switch to more of a sugar-free, anti-inflammatory, like non-processed food diet as um, much as possible, you might notice more energy through the day. And then if you even shift to like the ketosis idea, you can actually notice more energy with less food too, but that'd be a bit more complicated. Yeah, well, water, keto was actually, keto is actually something that I have considered because both of my parents who are, are much older, but 
they have had great success with keto. I mean, my, my father's in his late fifties and he's in the best shape he's ever been in his life. I mean, he's doing marathons now. So I, I think uh, ketosis is de- or keto is definitely, you know, a keto diet is definitely something that I'd consider, but like you right. said, it, it gets complicated, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Everything kind of becomes very compartmentalized and um, I think sold in a certain way. I would say try to listen to your body um, cause you can do keto and be extremely miserable or feel really well too. Um, Native Americans, they used to eat whenever they were hungry once or twice a day, three times a day, or not for the entire day. Then once the settlers came and civilized them and taught them to eat three times a day, they became our unhealthiest population by far. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely try to kind of inter- intermittent fast. I hmm. eat like at 11 and then eight is at the latest that I eat eight at night. And then I'm, yeah. and that's it. <laughs> yeah. So it's important to like take, take um, catalog and listen to your body. So asking yourself if you're truly hungry and like maybe giving it like 20, 30 minutes, if anyone's struggling with it, to see if they're actually hungry or waiting for it to pass can be a nice way to see if it's truly needed and then really assess what kind of foods you're eating and take inventory of how you're feeling before and after you eat. If you feel more tired after consuming the food, it might be a problem with the food or the way your body's processing it. And not everyone processes everything the same way. So you might want to take a diet diary and see what foods are good or bad for you. And if anyone has questions about foods or like wants to talk about what they're consuming, I'm always happy to talk to you all at our clinic as well. And before more questions, I just wanted to highlight this slide since Chrisana mentioned that she shops for her family of four for uh, fruits and vegetables. We are doing a community garden at our clinic to foster a clinic to table approach. We're calling it the Island Pharmacy and basically a community garden. I just wanna grow some vegetables, herbs, and whatever else we can and give it to people, give it to the community for free. Basically come here, pick what you need, plan what you want, talk about things you like, come come learn about yoga, nutrition. We'll do some classes. I'll do some teaching too and make it a real hub for the community. So it's on Stewart Road Family Medicine and uh, we're doing an opening ceremony next Friday at five o'clock for anyone who's interested, feel free to stop by. And in the springtime, we'll be doing a lot more things too. Also nutrition and community health too. So keep that in mind and um, come by anytime. That sounds great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, please excuse me, sir. Can you say, I heard you say Stuart Road uh, Family Medicine? Yeah. All right, it, perfect. It's at UTMB Health um, Family Medicine, 6710 Stuart Road, Suite 100. It's between the two yellow buildings if you go into the parking lot. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Good question so far. Yeah, and I just posted a question in there and I was tinkering around with something here. Um, Oh, lots of people waiting. Friday, December 10th, sorry. Yeah, I want to make sure. Is that December 10th or is that tomorrow? December 10th. Oh, okay. We switched it. (laughs) I do have another question, though, and that is about all the sugar substitutes. Are they they safe or are any safer than others or any to be avoided? Um, Generally speaking, um, stevia is probably a better sugar substitute than most other things, but... Um, I tend to have a belief that sugar, any sort of sugar substitute still spikes your insulin, makes your body think you're having something sweet, makes you go into the storage mode, increase your IGF-1 and makes your body, um, think it's consuming something and needs to hold on to it. So if you're really trying to lose weight and like optimize your health and feel more energetic, I would really try to avoid the sweeteners, but in terms of healthy sweeteners, Stevia and honey usually are the better way to go rather than the, um, the more complex um, uh, sweeteners that I think are not properly absorbed by the body that just pass through. But I really don't know or understand what kind of um, processes they leave behind in the body. 
I don't quite trust their mechanisms of action yet. And there's not enough data for me to say how safe they are, like aspartame and other things that they use in sodas or Coke Zeros. So I would not advocate those if it were up to me. So does that answer your question, Michael? It, it sure does. And uh, Nicholas has a question. And then I have one more quick follow-up question, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So you, you said something about complex sugars uh, compared to simple sugars. Uh, I'm not quite oh. familiar with. Oh, I just meant like the, the I meant the complex like um, the the artificial sweeteners like aspartame and other things that are like really complex forms of sugar that are not absorbed by the body. So the idea is they just pass through and you're not actually absorbing them. Um, oh. I'm not as privy, like I'm not as confident in those for health rather than like the natural sugars that occur in fruits. So like when you have like um, sugar from a fruit, it comes with all the fiber that absorbs slower in the bloodstream because the fiber and the sugar together is more normal, goes through the GI tract, goes through your colon and the sugar is absorbed much more slowly. But if you take the sugar in like whatever source of like a pastry or a soda, it goes directly into the bloodstream. And the artificial sugar oh. in the Coke Zeros, I still think stimulate that response of the insulin spike just because your body is tasting that sweetness too. So that's why I feel like if you drink um, diet Cokes or diet um, sodas all the time, it's it's a kind of an impediment to weight loss in my opinion. But you might yeah, ask have other opinions. Your body uh, goes through all the trouble of, of you know turning all the installation and the, the, the calorie storage and then there's kind of like a false call like so i guess eventually it stopped working correctly because it wouldn't know you know what, what's real and what's not real yeah i just think our bodies are confused i mean we're constantly exposed to so many like good things maybe too much of a good thing we're wired to go for sweet things because back in the day when you found something sweet you wouldn't know when your next availability of that thing was so you'd eat as much of it as possible like your body would crave it so you can get it until the next next feast or famine. So now that we have it available all the time, but we don't have a way of stopping our craving for it, it becomes dangerous. So now it takes that quality of mind to understand that it can be a problem. And um, it can be, same thing can be said about maybe the light in our mind too, because there's like so much colors and like TV and like all the stuff is constant stimulation to our minds. The only time you get all those colors in the day was either sunrise or sunset. But now all that light and stimulation is available all the time. And now we have to wear blue light filters or be aware of all the light we're taking in with our eyes to go to sleep at the right time too, because otherwise it affects our circadian rhythm. So with all the convenience we have, I think we should also be aware of all the ways to stay healthy too, because there's a term that I heard called civilized to death, and we want to take care of our health amidst all the modern conveniences. So... Dr. Campra, I have a question. Yes. Do you have any recommendations regarding water? I hate water. And I have been buying this uh, Nestle, uh, sometimes it's orange. And everybody at work tells me that it's tricking my body to make me think I'm drinking something else. But it's the only way I can consume water. Do you have like any natural recommendations for water? I hate water. I want to get you to love water, but uh, uh, an easy thing that we do for kids is uh, like fruit infused waters. So like just have like a giant jar of water and cut up some fruits. I like to add blueberries because it turns the water purple or blue. So they're like more interested in it and you can taste a little bit of the fruit in the water adds that flavor. But um, the artificially sweetened waters might not be the best thing, but if you want to try different um, kinds of waters, like I know in Texas, Topo Chico is really big. I don't know if you like those kind of carbonated waters, but that might be a, another alternative choice. Or trying the sugar fast and cutting out all sweeteners for three days might reset your taste buds. If you want to try that with me, we can do that okay. and take together if you want. Um, okay. If you want. I think it'd be fun. Okay. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, it's kind of like a two-parter question. Um, I know, of course, too much of sugar is a bad thing. Um, 
how do you feel about the kombucha drinks? All of my friends are on this kombucha, you know, kick and, you know, it's a fermented drink, which of course requires a good amount of sugar. Um, so I guess, and then the second part would be, you know, wine. How would you feel about wine? I've, there's that saying, you know, a glass a day keeps the doctor away or whatever. So <laughs> I wanted to hear your point of view on that. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of um, red wine high in reservatol, um, the thicker the period skin, like the Malbec wines aren't too bad. And as long as you're not added extra added sugar to it, I don't think it's much of a problem. So the kombucha, the wine, if it's coming from a natural process, if it's fermented and you're making it and you're not doing too much other stuff to it in the name of preservatives and adding sugar, I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. And again, all in moderation. If it's all you're drinking, it might be a problem. But if you're just enjoying it with um, with some dinner or with some friends, uh, really not a bad thing. And the fermented foods have a whole host of health benefits. So not just kombucha, but yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, all those things of different cultures can offer a lot of benefits. If you can make your own, even better. Uh, we try to make our own yogurt, um, which is pretty healthy too. So, Awesome, thank you. Yeah. One more question from me here, um, Dr. Campbell. I, I stress with students that, uh, that one of the things that takes place at universities is we explore questions you know, to, you know, to unearth new knowledge. Uh, are you doing research and can you share with us a question that you're focused on in your research? Yes, um, they like us to do research. So I find research doing research for the sake of research is really hard to do. So um, I like to do things I'm interested in. So the garden is something I want to do for our patients. And question a question we can ask is, does the garden benefit as a um, form of therapy for patients as they wait for the doctor's office? You didn't even say it. Um, does it um, does the garden help people with their anxiety, their depression, or their blood pressure? Um, seeing them before they have they use the garden as a waiting room to after they use the garden as a waiting room, do these markers improve? That's a simple question that our medical students can survey and check for our patients, um, which can be a research methodology question that we can do. Um, for me personally, um, for a more complex research project is uh, as a practitioner using a lot of therapies for mental health, I find that we are at an impasse for a lot of mental health treatment. Some of the medications I prescribe are very dangerous. Very common medications like antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicines have a black box warning. So a question I ask is, are there any natural herbal therapies to help with anxiety, depression, PTSD? And one of the studies our university is answering is, is possible to use things like psilocybin or other naturally occurring compounds to help with PTSD. And we're in the processes of developing a trial uh, with the IRB to explore that idea. And this is really not new questions. And the idea behind research is we have a hypothesis. So as long as you have a strong hypothesis and not a big bias, um, you can answer some good, interesting questions and be passionate about it. OK, well, uh, I, think, I think that covers us. Um, I want to say thank you to our to our wonderful audience for sticking with us for the first few minutes there. Um, and then uh, I've got a page and a half of notes uh, from this, so we will thank uh, Dr. Camper for that very much. And, uh, and we'll get this uh, posted for further review as soon as we can. And uh, so one more time, I say thank you to you. Say thank you to uh, Galveston College for sponsoring the lecture series. We're now somewhere around our 35th or 36th year, and uh, we get to add Dr. Camper to our, uh, our list of wonderful speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. I had an awesome time. Feel free to reach out any time with any questions. Any thank comments. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, doctor.